Hello and welcome to this episode of the Geoeconomic Agenda, a podcast from the Institute for Geoeconomics of the Asia-Pacific Initiative in Tokyo that investigates the connections between economics, politics, business, and society. I'm your host, Paul Neto, and I'm a visiting researcher here at the IOG. In a moment, we'll sit down with Dr. Mireya Solis of the Brookings Institution and author of Japan's Quiet Leadership, Reshaping the Indo-Pacific. But first, here are the latest developments from the world of geoeconomics. It appears the United States is stepping back from talks on the trade pillar in the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, or IPEF, putting the future of the entire agreement in doubt. IPEF is the Biden administration's proposal for U.S. economic engagement with the Indo-Pacific region, given the political difficulty of joining the Trans-Pacific Partnership. IPEF consists of four pillars, comprised of a trade pillar, a supply chain resiliency pillar, an infrastructure and clean energy pillar, and a tax and anti-corruption pillar. The negotiating partners have made progress on three of the four pillars and have gathered in San Francisco this month to finalize the trade pillar, which will effectively complete the agreement. It now appears that it won't be possible to reach an agreement on the trade pillar, following Senator Sherrod Brown's request that the pillar be dropped altogether due to the lack of enforceable labor provisions in IPEF. Brown is competing for re-election as a Democrat in a state that supported Trump in the last two elections, and many in the Biden administration believe that those losses are at least partly due to Democrats' embrace of trade liberalization. For the Biden administration, the hope is that they can support Brown's re-election campaign by taking trade liberalization off the table as a potential issue. Additionally, U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai said last month that the United States is withdrawing its support for key U.S. digital trade proposals, including those in IPEF, in order to allow Congress an opportunity to enact stronger regulations on technology. This has led to disagreement in the U.S. government over the future of digital trade policy, given that Ambassador Tai did not suggest proposals for new positions or offer a timeline for when new proposals may be made available. Politico has reported that the Commerce Department and State Department, as well as some voices in Congress, have concerns with the apparent pivot and lack of clarity going forward. At the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, or APEC, summit in San Francisco from November 11th to 17th, 21 Asia-Pacific economies released a statement calling for reform of the World Trade Organization, or WTO. The joint statement called for necessary reform to improve all of the WTO's functions, so that members can better achieve the WTO's foundational objectives and address existing and emerging global trade challenges. There was also an agreement on the San Francisco principles that would, as it says, integrate inclusivity and sustainability into trade and investment policy, a non-binding agreement to support cooperation on communication, information sharing, and environmental sustainability. On November 15th, China and Japan announced an agreement to establish a dialogue channel on export controls. The goal is to hold annual director-level talks between the two countries on controls like China's restrictions on the export of graphite and germanium in order to avoid possible escalation. Finally, the Japanese government supported chipmaker Rapidus announced that it will open a base in Silicon Valley by the end of March 2024 to produce two nanometer chips in collaboration with IBM. The plan was announced at a meeting in San Francisco organized by the Japanese government to assemble semiconductor and AI firms to discuss supply chain resiliency and increasing supply capacity of critical technologies. Rapidus and the University of Tokyo also announced they would partner with French research institute Leti on the development of one nanometer chips. Such chips would boost computer efficiency by 10 to 20 percent and are expected to enter the market in the early 2030s. This is the Geoeconomics Agenda with Paul Neto. Okay, today I'm sitting down with Dr. Mireya Solis of the Brookings Institution and the author of Japan's Quiet Leadership about how Japan's economic statecraft has helped shape the future of the region of the Indo-Pacific. Dr. Solis, Mireya, thank you for taking the time to talk with us today. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to join your podcast, Paul. So let's start with, with the book. Can you summarize the, the findings? What, what led you to write this in the first place? What you found as you were working on this? 
Yes, of course. So this book is a deep dive of what has happened during the so-called lost decades in Japan. I feel that that label has a grain of truth, but actually uh, we are overusing it to the extent that people assume that Japan has experienced across the border stagnation, whereas in fact a lot has happened inside Japan and outside Japan. And the book, you know, tracks Japan's adjustment to economic globalization, the evolution of its politics, why Japan now has a greater uh, leadership at the prime minister level, and also how Japan is coping with the challenges uh, overseas by developing a far more robust and proactive economic, uh, foreign economic policy, but also uh, a security policy that is innovating and trying to address the current uh, environment. So can you use a few examples from the book? You know, I think one of the things that people, I mean, at least in this, in you know, we're sitting in Tokyo right now, people will point to Japan's leadership in reviving the Trans-Pacific Partnership after Trump withdrew in 2017. Can you talk about how Japan was able to revive that agreement to what it is today? Sure, Paul. And this goes to the heart of the book's argument that in essence, what I, I make the case that sure enough, Japan has experienced a relative decline because of the slow economy, demographic trends, the military buildup around it. But that Japan has found a way to cope with some of these challenges by developing what I call a network strategy, a connectivity strategy. And the idea is that by forming these partnerships, by embarking on rulemaking, by becoming a champion of economic integration and security cooperation, Japan was able to punch above its weight. And in my mind, Japan cut its teeth in developing this more proactive um, uh, foreign policy with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which as you remember, had a very checkered uh, history in Japan. It took a long time for Japan to get to the TPP and sure. because it was triggering all the domestic sensitivities and in particular, the agricultural lobby was dead set against Japan joining the TPP because it felt that it would uh, be very seriously affected if Japan were to open its market to the United States, to Canada, Australia, big agricultural exporters. Uh, but this began to change when uh, Prime Minister Abe came into office the second time. And uh, I think that he basically identified TPP as a tool to uh, bring credibility to his economic reform agenda of Abenomics, but also think about how you deepen the relation with the United States, how you go from trade being an item of bilateral friction and being a barrier to what Japan could do overseas and actually project outward, project forward and use TPP membership as a way in which Japan can now play in the big leagues. And uh, there's a couple of speeches that the Prime Minister uh, gave that I think identified this uh, greater level of ambition and both the pursuit of economic and um, foreign policy objectives. Now, how was he able to do what others had not been able to do before? That's why you need to dig at the evolution of the domestic political economy. And what you find is a number of factors. One is that the agricultural lobby lost clout. Um, you know, they were not as powerful in mobilizing uh, the vote. And there were other economic interests that were very interested in Japan joining these trade agreements because Japan was uh, lagging behind. Every other country was negotiating right and left. So uh, Japanese businesses were being discriminated against by not being part of this network of uh, free trade agreements. And that was one factor. But the other factor is that Prime Minister Abe was able to capitalize on a number of administrative and political reforms that had strengthened the prime minister's office. And he was able then to rein in the different warring bureaucracies and for the first time create a unified body to negotiate with greater depth and ambition. And that was the TPP headquarters. So I think it was very important for the prime minister to bring Japan to, uh, and you know, Japan was the last member to join. Uh, yeah, so I think right. it almost missed the, the window and, and, you know, things changed because of its ability to get in just at the last uh, opportunity. Mm. But it's also not just TPP. Japan's also been active in the RCEP negotiations, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. I'm hoping I got that acronym correct. And other similar agreements in the region. So this isn't just 
TPP. This is this seems to be a cornerstone of Japan's entire strategy, foreign policy toward the region. Is that fair to say? I think it's fair to say. So TPP showed a different Japan to the world, one that could actually undertake very substantive uh, tariff uh, liberalization, even in sensitive sectors. But it also showed Japan as a rule maker on trade and investment disciplines. And this opened then the way for other uh, very large trade agreements. The Japan-EU trade agreement is also high right. ambition uh, mm-hmm. undertaking. And then the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership that you mentioned, Paul, that one doesn't have the same standards as the CPTPP, right. but it does right. have very significant uh, mm-hmm. coverage just because of the sheer size of the economies mm-hmm. and does have some chapters that are interesting, not as ambitious, but nevertheless does have a digital economy uh, partnership a, a chapter. And it's not only what it did in trade, but it's also that, you know, Japan had been in the business of providing economic assistance and infrastructure finance for decades. But for a long time, that was perceived mostly as a mercantilist project, trying to advance the very narrow economic interest of a specific uh, Japanese industries. And we also saw a revival of infrastructure finance for strategic purposes. And a lot of this had to do with the competition with China and the uh, launch of the Belt and Road. And that's when the Abe administration came with this level of label of the uh, Partnership for Quality Infrastructure with the idea that Japan would be providing infrastructure finance with a different set of principles and standards. It was not zero-sum competition with China, but it was providing an alternative so that developing Asia would not only have to rely on one source of uh, financing, and that was very uh, much welcomed um, across the region. Now, the the point about zero-sum, avoiding zero-sum competition, is interesting because one of the features that I think people think about when they think about economic statecraft are the coercive features, the the sanctions, the export controls, the financial controls, this and this and that. When when I read uh, economic statecraft initiatives in the US covered by the US press, almost inevitably there's a reference about how this is going to contain China or constrain China. But that doesn't quite seem to be what Japan is doing. You don't, to me at least, you don't seem to hear nearly as much in Japan about economic controls or sanctions, although that's part of it. Comparing, comparing and contrasting Japan's approach and the US approach, or maybe the Western European approach, however you want to frame it, comparing those two approaches, one seems to be coercive and one seems to be more proactive, more more rule building. So two questions. One, is that fair? Is that a fair characterization? And two, why is that? Yeah, uh, well, the way I would describe it, Paul, the way I would frame it is to me, economic statecraft means the use of economic tools to achieve larger foreign policy objectives. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be coercive by nature, although that's a very common use of the term. And we know that getting into definitions <laughs> can be going down the rabbit hole. But I, I think of it as a more neutral term uh, when you have you know, mm-hmm. these economic tools at their disposal and you're thinking about grand strategy or foreign policy objectives, pursuing the national mm-hmm. interest more broadly. And within that uh, uh, umbrella of different economic uh, tools that you can use, then I make a distinction between whether you're trying to play defensive And that's what I think mostly what the United States is doing by linking economics with national security. And the effort there, the thrust of the effort is to reduce vulnerabilities that come from economic interdependence. And uh, think about how you can use your control over choke points in the supply chain as a source of leverage. So this is mostly seen through a national security lens. And you ask why the United States does that um, so uh, lops in such a lopsided manner. And I think it's because, um, first of all, there's been an awakening in, in the United States about the risks of uh, engaging very broadly with China and then what happens when there are cases of over-dependence. Um, and also because the United States, unfortunately, because of its own domestic political constraints, cannot articulate a compelling economic engagement strategy. And that would be trade policy, for example, that has become such a taboo word in the United States. 
Whereas in Japan, I think that Japan has a more balanced portfolio when it thinks about the objectives and the tools of economic statecraft. Because sure enough, Japan is in many ways on the same uh, wavelength of the United States when it thinks about how to close vulnerabilities, how to avoid overdependence, how to boost its control over um, uh, important choke points. That there's a term that comes in Japanese documents, one of a strategic indispensability. That's something that we'd inherit a few years ago and goes to that exactly, um, yes. marriage of economics and uh, security. So that's very much very vibrant in Japan. I think that that's mm-hmm. an area of economic statecraft that it's also experiencing quite a lot of um, a growth and, mm-hmm. and there's a lot happening there. But Japan does still have a very substantive track record from our previous conversation just a few minutes ago mm-hmm. that it's at the center of these mega trade agreements in the region. Mm. And now it has uh, these chops in terms of being able to uh, negotiate effectively the new uh, uh, set of rules on trade and investment. Having said that, Paul, I do think that um, Japan has done well so far, but it's getting harder. And mm. it's getting harder because it is good to have both sides of economic statecraft, but there's tension between Mm -hmm. promoting economic integration and hedging against Mm -hmm. the risks of it, trying to develop a a club of of trusted partners, and those are the ones we talk to about economic security, and then these very uh, uh, ambitious network power trying to create a lot of linkages with all kinds of countries. Mm -hmm. And I think it's we're witnessing this balancing act uh, going on right now uh, in Tokyo. It's interesting that you mentioned that balancing act because I think you're absolutely right. Japan has experience in economic coercion and developing tools to to build in supply chain resiliency, going back at least to the uh, rare earths, quote unquote, embargo back in what was it, 2010, correct? Um, So Japan has been thinking about this for a long time. And yet, as you pointed out, they have been able to balance to a degree the this drive towards economic security, this resiliency, while also engaging in systems building, rules making, that kind of thing. And you, you don't think that that balance can last much longer. Is that what you're saying? Well, I think that there are going to be trade-offs, right? Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I do believe Japan is a committed multilateralist. I do believe Japan mm-hmm. is... Uh, you know, pushing uh, as much as it can to sustain a rules-based order. Mm -hmm. But it's also uh, very true that when governments invoke national security to uh, avoid, you know, uh, the constraints of existing rules Mm -hmm. in the WTO or in other endeavors, that ends up undermining, eroding the rules-based economic order. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to invoke national security all the time. You don't want to do it willy-nilly. And ideally, there can be some principles and rules that also guide the invocation of that national security. Mm -hmm. But you have to um, be aware that some governments are not going to be that disciplined. (laughs) And also, you know, that uh, what national security can be in the eyes of the beholder, right? Right. If you remember when the Trump administration began to use the 232 of U.S. trade laws that allow the United States to raise tariffs invoking the national uh, security Mm -hmm. uh, rationale, and he did it um, with the steel uh, uh, tariffs, uh, it produced a report to try to justify the action. At the end of the day, you did not find a strong national security rationale, but it was about giving a lifeline, uh, Mm -hmm. giving... Uh, uh, support to a politically powerful uh, group. So that's always been the concern. The, mm-hmm. the architects of the WTO knew this very well when they drafted right. the Article 21 mm-hmm. of the then GATT and then uh, later on WTO. And the idea is that, again, you cannot, uh, if you want to, uh, uh, you know, uh, protect the rules-based economic system, there has to be some discipline on how you invoke the national security principle. I think Japan has been principled and, and has uh, been restrained, mm-hmm. but we are operating in an environment where uh, that invocation is coming more naturally, more often, mm-hmm. and it's going to eventually create a, it's already creating a huge challenge to the international um, multilateral system of trade. So let's use that as a jumping off point to talk about one of the big uh, 
yeah, I guess you could call it a big development in global economics over the past week when the U.S. basically, United States, hit the pause button on IPEF, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Now, for those of you who haven't been you know, following IPEF developments, this was basically the Biden administration's answer to TPP, recognizing that it's not going to get ratification through Congress. And the Biden administration hasn't even tried to do trade promotion authority, which would help facilitate ratification. And so this was, I guess you could call it the next best thing, or you can call it what you'd like. But apparently, the according to what we've read over the past week, we're recording on November 21st, even that's not attainable. And given that we're talking about a current event and everything is kind of fluid, I have read a couple of reports saying that Japan is going to try to you know, keep this boat afloat as much as it can. So first of all, what do you think about the U.S. with, you know, regarding IPEF and just its approach to economic strategy in general vis-a-vis the Indo-Pacific? Um, is this, is the U.S. completely out of the game? And two, can Japan re, refloat this thing uh, similar to what it did with the TPP? I mean, this is all speculative, I know, so do the best you can. But um, this, I don't know, I, I think is, this points to a, where the tension, where Japan, where the region is heading on these issues. Thank you, Paul. Those are excellent questions. Let me um, sort of uh, break down my answer in a, at least, mm-hmm. I think, three uh, parts. Um, so what happened last week? Um, you know, even before uh, we went into the APEC uh, Leaders Week, there was an expectation that three of the pillars would close, but that trade mm-hmm. pillar would not be fully ready, but that there would be progress, and that perhaps it would be possible to, you know, talk about some early harvest. Right. Uh, and right. then what actually happened is that, indeed, the uh, IPEF members were able to sign the pillar on the supply chain, and we're able to finalize the other two pillars on uh, clean energy and uh, anti-corruption and taxation. But uh, nothing uh, was able to be released or announced on the trade pillar, which is really a blow because that's where all the eyes have always been. The other pillars exactly. are, uh, can be interesting. Sure, they can be helpful. They're mostly aspirational. They're mostly mm-hmm. soft cooperation language. and. The supply chain pillar in particular might be interesting, but uh, we don't know if, you know, at the time of um, urgency crisis, is this really going to create what uh, is the expectation of a better coordination, more information sharing, and even helping one another? That we don't know, because that uh, supply chain pillar, what they did is that basically the outcome at this point is that committees will be created and they will draft plans. So. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we don't know what's going to come out out of that. But but the trade pillar is, I think, where the crux of the matter is because the stakes are very high. Uh, that's where the labor standards, environmental standards, and digital rules are housed, and that's under the jurisdiction of the USTR. Mm-hmm. And uh, two things happened, I think, that explain why the trade pillar did not have a good showing so that it didn't have even a, an early harvest uh, announcement. One is um, that you know when the IPEF, when the Biden administration announced IPEF, it uh, it uh, proposed it, it posed that it could achieve a high level negotiation on labor standards, really uh, ambitious binding labor standards, mm-hmm. without putting on the table market access. So this was always a proposition that I thought was very. Um, uh, Tenuous? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it was doubtful uh, that you can get more with less mm. because they want the labor standards that went yeah. beyond what was in TPP offering fewer right. benefits. So it's very difficult to think that that could happen. And I think what we saw is that, yeah, it did not happen because countries in developing uh, um, uh, nations in, in the Indo Pacific are saying, why are we going to be subject to this kind of uh, obligation? There's nothing um, uh, in terms of market access. So that was one, I think, um, issue that uh, just uh, was very clear from last week. But the other one Mm -hmm. is that just in the past few weeks, the United States 
you know, pivoted very sharply into position on digital economy rules. And right. first, uh, this was announced at the United States in the uh, WTO e-commerce negotiations. is no longer supporting the talks when it comes to freedom of data flows, when it comes mm -hmm. on the protection of source code and the ban of data localization. These have been the pillars of U.S. digital trade policy. And the United States is saying, no, we're not going to support that anymore. And they hit the pause button on the mm. IPEF as well. And this has to do with the fact, I think, bottom line, you cannot negotiate an agreement when you yourself don't have a domestic consensus on what you want to negotiate. And, uh, you know, there's been a lot of pushback here in the U.S. for that kind of, of provision, but there's also a lot of support. And it, mm -hmm. I believe that it's possible to have this, you know, public interest precautionary principle and freedom of data flows as part of the uh, same trade agreement. I think you can reconcile both objectives. But the Biden administration decided it did not want to go there. Mm -hmm. And I think that explains why uh, we don't have even um, any kind of result at this moment uh, for IPEF. Yeah. Um, right. Now, I think another part of your question is, uh, can, does the U.S. have no game? Um, I think it's not this game. I mean, yeah. I think that um, yeah. trade uh, uh, agreements is something that the Biden administration is critical about. They're mm -hmm. not going to pursue any, anything mm -hmm. that has tariff realization. But there are other ways, I think, in which the United States uh, still has substantial mm -hmm. economic uh, influence. That has to do, first of all, with the strength of the U.S. economy, particularly at a time when China is stumbling. Mm -hmm. And also has to do with the... A competitiveness of the American uh, of American industry, uh, you know, uh, American companies are in the lead when it comes to um, uh, the design segment of the semiconductor industry. The American companies invest very heavily in um, in the Indo Pacific. So again, mm -hmm. these are strong suits that uh, also make the American uh, position strong in the region, even though they're not in the business anymore. The United States of you know thinking about comprehensive, high ambition uh, trade agreements. Mm -hmm. And your last uh, question here, Paul, was can Japan refloat um, mm. the IPEF? Can it uh, do the kind of rescue operation it did when it did the, uh, the CPTPP? I yeah. think it's hard. I think it's hard. And there are a couple of reasons. One is that Japan has been um, supporting IPEF as plan B. It will never be mm -hmm. plan A for right. Tokyo. And Tokyo right. has been very explicit, and uh, they have um, told uh, Washington counterparts time and time again, every meeting I said, I can tell you this happens, where, uh, you know, they, they make the case that uh, it's better for the United States to be in the CPTPP for a number of reasons, right. for economic engagement, right. for uh, trying to avoid overdependence on China, for trying to offer rules that are, you know, uh, uh, ambitious and high standard. But the U.S. does not want to consider that. And therefore, Japan went along with IPEF, was support, has been supportive. Yeah. IPEF launched in Tokyo. Japan mm -hmm. provided advice about having a very inclusive uh, membership. But I don't think that's where Japan's central interest uh, mm -hmm. is. That's one reason. The other one is that IPEF is very much seen as a U.S.-led undertaking. Yes. And if the U.S. cannot lead in the trade uh, pillar, as yes, uh, watered down as it is, then that takes away a lot of incentives, especially because the United States is going to an election, presidential election year next year. Right. So, you know, uh, CPTPP and IPEF are very different. Mm -hmm. um, and as you mentioned, IPEF does not require congressional ratification. But there are some parallels, I think, between what happened in uh, TPP 1.0 mm. and IPEF in the sense that the United States had a very abrupt redirection um, you know, yeah. Trump left TPP, the Biden administration then is not pushing for digital rules the mm -hmm. way that the U.S. has traditionally done. And then these important economic initiatives are going to be supposedly finalized, taken to the finish line in a presidential uh, election year in the United States, when we know it's going to be yeah. very, very loaded and whether the uh, president is going to have, you know, the desire to put political capital in such an such an initiative right. is not clear at all. So I, I don't think that there's going to be a revival of. I think that if uh, IPEF uh, becomes something of substance, 
it largely now it's for the U.S. Uh, uh, to make the push and certainly um, deliver something that the other IPEF members would like to see on the trade pillar. That's going to be, I think, the litmus test. Yeah. Well, thank you. This has been a fascinating discussion, um, and thank you so much for joining us today. This is definitely going to be a space to watch, and your book, Japan's Quiet Leadership from the Brookings Institution, is definitely a topic that I think readers and observers of this space are going to benefit from very, very much. So I strongly recommend it to everyone listening. And once again, thank you for joining us today. It was my great pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is the Geoeconomics Agenda with Paul Netto. Finally, Thanksgiving dinner, which Americans celebrated last week, is known for a few specific foods that are supposed to appear at every table during the holiday. Turkey, potatoes, green beans, corn, cranberry sauce, pumpkin pie, and maybe sweet potatoes if you're from the South. What all these foods have in common is that they're all native to the Americas. Turkeys, corn, and pumpkins for pie were first domesticated in Mexico. Potatoes were first cultivated in what's now Peru. Green beans and sweet potatoes were domesticated in Central and South America, and cranberries are native to New England. Now, most of these foods wouldn't have appeared on the table of the first Thanksgiving. As most Americans know, the first Thanksgiving dinner was celebrated over three days in 1621 in Plymouth Colony in what's now Massachusetts by the survivors of the Mayflower Expedition who survived their first winter in America with the help of the native Wampanoag tribe who joined them for the celebration. The dinner would have looked much different from what Americans know now and featured fish like eel, cod, and bass, wild ducks, venison, and more. The only foods that would have looked familiar would be the wild turkeys, corn, and probably cranberries, but everything naturally consisted of what could have been harvested locally. Many of the other foods made their way to the Thanksgiving table more circuitously, usually via England or Spain. Domestic turkeys and potatoes were brought back to England, where they were further domesticated and adapted to European climates and palates, and then made their way back to the Americas for consumption when European settlement of North America intensified. It wasn't until after World War II, when intensive production of turkeys and refrigeration drove down the price of turkey, making what was once a luxury food something within reach of the common consumer, and the historic connotation of turkeys with Thanksgiving finally became a staple of Thanksgiving dinner. Even if American Thanksgiving is truly a Pan-American meal, it still wouldn't have been possible without globalization. That's all for this episode, but stay tuned for more on the way. Until then, we want to know what you want to hear about, as well as take your questions for our show. So send us an email at geoeconomicagenda at ihj.global. Be sure to like, rate, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, tell your friends, and most of all, keep listening. Thanks for joining us. Thanks to the team at API for making this happen, and we'll talk to you next time.